So in section 7.4, we're going to be making confidence intervals which estimate a population parameter. Specifically, we'll be estimating a mean. Now we've already estimated a mean, but it was when sigma was known and now it's unknown. Don't forget sigma is the symbol for the population standard deviation. So now we're gonna find confidence intervals for means where we don't have a standard deviation from the population. So the first thing we have to consider is which table to use because it turns out we're gonna be using a new table. So if sigma is known, then we use the standard normal table, also referred to as the Z table. But in the case where sigma is unknown, we're gonna be using, sorry, sigma's not known, we're gonna be using the student T distribution called the T table. Um, our population still needs to be normally distributed or large enough, and we'll talk more about that later. But let's learn about this new student T distribution called the T table. So the full name, like I said, is student T distribution because somebody published it as using the name student. Um, it turns out there is actually a different table for each sample size n, but the table we use just takes some key items off of every table and puts them onto a single table. So instead of having 60 different tables for each of 60 different sample sizes, they kind of went and took like the 90% confidence interval off all 60 tables and then just had to list 60 numbers on a single table. Discussing the distribution, it is still bell-shaped and it's still centered about mu, but for really small sample sizes, the curve is super wide. So it's got that bell-shaped curve, but it really looks almost stretched out and flattened down. Um, also, some things to know, the mean still equals zero, just like the normal curve, but the standard deviation no longer equals one, like on the normal distribution. And as a matter of fact, not only does the standard deviation not equal one, it's different for every sample size. So the total area under the curve is still one, with 50% of that area being to the left of mu, which is the center, and the other 50% to the right of mu, the mean, right? So 100% is just split into two parts. Along the bottom of the curve, instead of listing z-scores, we list t-scores. Kind of would expect that. Um, and again, if we're letting mu be our center and it's zero, then anything to the left of mu would be a negative t-score, and anything to the right of mu would be a positive t-score. And something else you're going to notice on the table that you haven't seen yet is along the left side, we're going to see what's called degrees of freedom. So I'd like to go ahead and define that. So it's the number of variables that can vary, kind of weird sounding, right? After certain restrictions have been made, and it's denoted by n minus 1, where n is your sample size. So I'm just going to give you a little example to explain what's happening with degrees of freedom. So imagine three numbers add up to, I could pick anything, but I picked 25. So we're free to choose the first two numbers, but when it comes to the third number, I don't get a choice in that because I need the total to be 25. So I can't choose the third number, I'm forced to, to have it make my total of 25. So in terms of degrees of freedom, you know, I've got 3 minus 1, right, n minus 1. So in my case, since I've got three numbers, I've got two numbers I'm free to choose. So like here's my example. Three numbers add up to 25. I'm free to choose the first two. We could pick anything. I'm going to pick 7 and uh, 12. Didn't matter. But these two numbers add up to 19. I can't just go pick 1, 56, whatever I want for that third one because I really need to do, you know, 25 minus what I have so far. So 25 minus 19 is 6. I'm not free to choose that third digit. It had to be a 6.